Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Please take your handbooks and turn to 146. 143, I'm sorry, 143. strap has broken and so are there extra masks where coming my way thank you all right well thank you very much there now we're back and safe again all right um, it's good to see these masks I'll tell you what I read today be it true be it not true but I'll tell you what I read that Governor Newsom led the state of California into a contract of $1 billion with a Chinese company to manufacture masks for us. And then, all is that accurate? Has anybody else heard, you heard that to be a case? And I don't have all the, the answers for that. It just kind of makes you wonder, is that why we're still wearing masks? Is because we've got an excess or something? I don't have all the answers. For that, not in the slightest. So, let me um, let me read to you just a little bit. There's not a lot to say uh, in Gary Shots. I don't mean that in a bad way. Just as an evangelist, he is uh, not on the road as much at the moment. Um, Brother Shock is an evangelist that our church supports out of Alabama, and he gave a wonderful outline dealing with the topic of the fathers. He said. Fathers are to realize the grave responsibility given to them. Every father is a pattern and leaves an heritage to his children. He said, note, Lot was a selfish father, living for monetary gains, giving no regard to spiritual matters. Eli was a slack father, putting no restraints upon his sons, hence the gory is the glory is departed. Noah was a serving father, preparing an ark to the saving of his house. Abraham was a submitting father, offering his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah. 
Joshua was a successful father, leading his family to serve the Lord. But our God is a satisfying father, giving good gifts to his children. He gave his only begotten son that we might have life. He gave us the Holy Spirit that we might be empowered. He gave us the power of the Bible that we might have understanding. He gives us grace that we might make it through the trials of life. And he gives us the blessed hope of Jesus soon return that we can know the best is yet to come. And that, that's, a, that's a good outline. It doesn't matter who preaches that, man. That's good stuff. Brother Shock goes on to say that they did pick up a couple of meetings that were not scheduled. He said, we spent two weeks in Alvarado, Texas. The first week we worked on their new church building and preached at night in the old building. He said, we went from there to Midwest City, Oklahoma for the weekend, then back to the second week to continue working to help them have their first service there on June 7th. So it's a church plant work apparently. I had the privilege to preach the first message in the new building. And so what a blessing that is. That's our evangelist, Gary Shock. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Marcos, would you pray for us, please, sir? Dear Lord, I come to you in Jesus' name and just want to thank you for this time you've given us. I want to thank you for your Bible and for the shock that you report. Lord, I pray that you be with him and all our evangelists and, and our missionaries that we support be with them and their families and, and us and the ones that can make it tonight, Lord, be with them and also that we will consider you in our lives. Lord, you know what we need. But we just want to thank you for this time and thank you for your word and your faithfulness and your goodness towards us. I pray that you just help us tonight to understand your words and your words will help you course upon us and be able to apply it to our lives and to, to remain uh, or remind us of, of your words and to be able to apply them to, to us and tonight and tomorrow and whenever these things may come up, Lord, that you would help us just to, to live for you and, and uh, as you empower us, Lord. As Brother Shock said, thank you for this time again and, and please help us and meet with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to just go back to prayer. Uh, we got word this week that Brother Archie Abad, um, our missionary to Hong Kong, has had to come back. He's having health issues. And uh, they're in Southern California in Carson. It's looking like he probably will not be going back to Hong Kong because of these problems. And he told us, asked us to just drop his support. But I, I don't want us to just drop his support at the moment. I'd like us to support him until I can hear that he's here and he's got his feet under him. Um, he, he's not leaving for a bad reason. He's leaving for an understandable reason. And so I asked James to go ahead and send out the support. He got the, the word before, um, before he sent out this, this month's support, but I asked him to go ahead and send it out and then let's just kind of watch and hear and be sure he's got his feet under him. But let's go back to the Lord in prayer. James, would you mind praying for Brother Archie, please? Okay, okay thank you. Tell me, Father, thank you for the church service you've given us. Please help Brother Abad as he's back in the States. Thank you for the work he did do while he was in Hong Kong. Please. Bless those people that he was that he brought to Christ. Mm -hmm. Please help them to continue um, for you. But please help for the bad's health as he as they're back in the states. Please heal them and give them um, wisdom that you what you want them to do for the now and for the future. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 One hundred, two hundred and sixty-two, two six two. Verse one. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus, like sunshine at noonday. Oh, 
was for. No need in the sunlight in heaven will snow. The light of the world is Jesus. The lamp is the light in that city of gold. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has gone upon me. Two hundred and ninety-two. Two at nine two. together as we read together Numbers 27 beginning in verse 12 through the remainder of the chapter. Numbers 27, we want to begin in verse 12 and read through the remainder of the chapter together. Let's begin in verse 12 please. And the Lord said unto Moses, get thee up into this mount Eberim, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast set it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes, that is, the water of Meribah in Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, 
that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight, and thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord, at his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. What's going on? Moses just got told, basically, you're not going into the promised land. He basically just got told, you're going to die before you go in there. You see it referencing it when it said back in verse 12 and 13, and it speaks of him, it says, you're going to be gathered unto thy people. And it says, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. And he's referencing a death that's going to happen. Now, it told him why it was going to happen. You saw it in verse 14, why Moses was not permitted to go into the promised land. He said, the strife of the congregation. He said, I wanted you to sanctify me at the uh, water before their eyes. That is, that is the water of Meribah. You remember he was told to speak to the rock and he smote it yet the second time. And God's telling him, that's why you're not going into the promised land. Now, how long did they wander in the wilderness? 40 years they've wandered in the wilderness. So Moses has 40 years of his life in this event invested into getting to the time they can cross into the promised land. And he's told he's not going. Not one time do you see Moses say, God, that's not fair. God, why? Not one time do you see that out of Moses. He knew he did wrong. You say, well, isn't this a little bit harsh? Take it up with God. It's what he did. God saw fit. But here's the thing that marvels me. He just got what I would deem very discouraging news. You're not going to enter into the promised land that you've been leading this crowd for 40 years. You're not going. What astounds me is Moses thought. He said in verse 16, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Right there, he could have been lower lip tucked out and sucking his thumb and all down and out, but he had the people at his heart. Yeah. God, if you're taking me, I've been over the people to this point away, would you at least give them a godly man to oversee it? Did you catch what he said in verse 17? He said in verse 17, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and bring, which may bring them in. And he said this, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Every opportunity for him to get all down and out and feeling low, but he thought of others. Praise God, what a leader Moses was. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you. And Father, what a wonderful example you've put before me as a pastor and before us as a congregation. And Father, I ask that you would help me to think of this congregation before I think of me. And I ask God that you would help this congregation 
to follow, Father, and to be what you desire to be and understand that, yes, your judgment does fall even on the man of God when he chooses to not obey. We love you, Lord. Help us to love you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. 343. Three, four, three. singing this evening. Before we get into the Bible, I think I'll tell one more story. I talked with Aaron today. He and uh, his wife Brenda were on their way to preach that he has gout, and so he's got a struggle going on there. But uh, they're on their way, and I told him we showed the, uh, the uh, YouTube thing of, their, uh, of him in the Judiciary Committee, and I told him that we... I read the thing, you know, thank God for a governor like that. And he said, well, let me tell you one more story about our governor. He said that there was a group just exactly the same as what Seattle has. What's it called? What's the A? The uh, Chaz, but it's something, something, something zone. Do you remember what that A stands for? What is it? I, I, I couldn't hear you. And it's just the mask, I'm sure. Okay. Okay, I don't really remember, but the same kind of system started directly across from the state capitol building in Nashville, Tennessee. And the governor, as they began to put up their barricades, sent in the highway patrol and said, you cannot put barricades up in the city of Nashville. And stopped them. And so they were a little upset about that. And they said, well, this is going to be our zone. When they said, this will not be part of the state of Tennessee, it will be their zone, he said that basically you are uh, taking away what does not belong to you, and anybody we see doing it will be arrested. And they arrested 21 people. Put them in jail for trying to set up a zone. Now he said, you can protest all you want as long as it's peaceful and as long as there is no looting, uh, nothing of that nature. Definitely no zones will be set up. And he stopped it. And I thank God for it. I don't understand yet. I have not heard the reasoning. So maybe there's a reason. But I do not understand why the governor of Washington has not put an end to what's going on in Seattle. And I do not understand why President Trump has not sent the National Guard. Because anything that attacks this homeland, the scripture says, foreign or domestic, our government is supposed to protect us from it. And in my estimation, that's a domestic problem that is a threat 
to this country and to that state and to that city and I don't understand the president nor the governor and maybe they have good reasons but I don't understand them to this point I can say that much so anyway I've got my political spew out of me let's take our Bibles please this evening and I want us to go please I had a little outline but I'm going to forego that as far as fathers and I'm going to forego that I think brother Shocks was marvelous and that was a blessing. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. I want to look into verses 1 through 6 this evening. Proverbs chapter 3. Famous passage, famous verses, marvelous verses in this Proverbs. And stand with me as we... Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 down through verse 6. The scripture says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. The last two verses are marvelous as well. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, what a marvelous series of verses. We thank you, Father, for them. We're not trying to say the rest of the view, your word is of not a value, but Father, these verses are of great value to us. Trust in you, God, with all our hearts. And lean not into our own understanding. God, help us. We'll do sinful things trying to persuade you that we're doing right if you do not intervene. God, help us. Give us victory over this flesh. God, we come before your throne tonight and we're concerned about our nation and I believe rightfully concerned. I have heard the words show up from governmental officials more than once, many times, the word anarchy. Father, there seems to be a power in our nation that's trying to overthrow our government. It's trying to take our country away from us right under our nose. Father, I thank you for a governor like Bill Lee in Tennessee. And I ask God that you will give him wisdom, give him guidance, give him courage, give him protection. And Father, I ask that you give us 49 more governors just like him. I ask God that you'll give us a president that will make a stand. I understand, Lord, at least this much, that the president is fearful of bloodshed in Seattle if he tries to stop it. But Lord, please, at least as our nation has been to this point, we cannot and would not allow people to just take it from us without even a stand trying to stop it. Father, I don't know, and I certainly am not saying it, but I am asking that it's not the case that he's not making a decision because of an election opportunity. Fearful of losing votes. God, may we not give our country away just to gain votes. Father, all I know is give us some politicians that will take advantage of the opportunity they have to be in that position. And if they lose the position based upon their efforts to do right, then, Father, at least they will be held accountable for doing right with the time they had. Thank you for our church. 
you have blessed us. And just as firmly as I pray for our politicians, I pray for our church. Help us, Father, to do right. Help us to take advantage of the opportunity to be a Christian in this dark time. Father, we ask that we will bring you much glory. Your Bible is open, Lord. Oh, God, it's the word that will keep us from sin or it's the word that will get us out of sin. It's the word that will increase our faith. It's your word that tells of the cleansing power of the shed blood of Christ. Lord, we've got a miracle book open this evening. And we're asking you, God, the God of miracles, to perform a miracle in our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, and you may be seated. This chapter 3, especially these six verses, are marvelous verses. I want you to notice what he said in verse 5 when he said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. I've got it circled. He said that, And lean not unto thine own understanding. I don't want to take the time to go into other places to draw a point. I'm just going to tell it to you. The Bible speaks of our trusting God is a form of our worshiping God. And so this verse 5 has a worshipful attitude included in other things. Life's problems are surfacing. Trust God. And I know I can say that. But trust God with all thine heart has a worship tone as well in it. So worship God with all thine heart. Verse 6 says, in all, there's another all. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Two words in there give us a hint of what this thought is, and it gives, gives you the hint of where I came from for the word I'm putting on verse 6. You see the word ways, and you see the word paths. And I took the word walk. In verse 5, the all of worship. In verse 6, the all of our walk. In verse 9, we find another all. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of, there it is, all thine increase. Here we find first fruits and increase, and therefore you can see it as well, the wealth of us. All our wealth. You say, I give to God his part, 10%. Oh no, you don't understand. His part is all of it. He just tells us what to do with 10%, and then, if you'll listen carefully, he'll tell you what to do with the rest of it. Okay. It's all his. And so we see three alls, worthy, all three of that. That's a sermon within itself. The all of worship, the all of the walk, and the all of wealth. Well, I'm not dealing with that tonight, but it was just good, and I thought I'd share it with you. Tonight I want to deal with obtaining God's blessings and if I were to take you back a year and a half ago, I preached a message dealing with out of this text with obtaining God's blessings and tonight I want to pick up from what I preached a year and a half ago, I'm sure you remember it, no I'm joking, but I want to pick up and add to that if I could. There are several steps that we need to be in doing to obtain God's blessings. In the previous year and a half ago time, I taught of a first step, and that's the only thing I said. It was the only point I dealt with in obtaining God's blessings in that sermon, and it was this thought, total surrender of your life to Christ. 
I want God's blessings. It begins with you giving to God before you can get under the promises of getting from God. Now, does God bless you at, uh, at other times? Maybe so, but there's no promise for that. It's when we're found obedient that we can find God's fulfillment of a promise to bless. And so we dealt with a total surrender of our lives. Tonight, I'll point out to begin with that this step of obedience, there's some common things. There really are. I, I could, I, I, I can, let me give you a list of what I wrote down. Just things of commonness. You're here tonight, church attendance. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Put you a Bible verse beside that. If you've been saved and you haven't been baptized, baptism is a form of obedience. We can look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Then as well, there's soul winning or witnessing as he puts it in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. These are things we should be doing. You say, preacher, we don't have soul winning going on yet. No, I understand that. It wouldn't go over real big right at the moment. But you still should be telling people about Jesus Christ. You still should be carrying tracts with you and individually giving them out. The command to, to be a witness be obedient there. Malachi 3 verse 10 tells us we ought to be tithing. Just commands of God. Submitting ourselves. John 15 7 talks about our Bible reading. I'm not asking but certainly you as a child of God are reading your Bible on a daily basis. Would you let me ask the question? How dare you ask anything of God when you're not doing what he is asking of you. Amen. Read your Bible. Yep. Pray. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Pray. And we're living in a society that hates the next word that I use. But it's still in this Bible. Separation. Yes. You've heard me say it and I'll say it again. We've got heaven's people here in this earth, we should look different, smell different, sound different, act different, walk different. The list goes on and on. Dress different. I mean, it's just a, a thing. Separation. Well, let me give us three more points tonight. Now, let me turn from that. Let me read verse 5 and 6 again. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But I'm after that one phrase in verse 6. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. The point I'm after right here is an acknowledging of God all the time. Mm -hmm. An acknowledging of God. Trust in the Lord is what he said in verse 5. And if you're going to acknowledge him in verse 6, you're going to have to trust him in verse 5. Because there are some places in this earth and in this society that it's not easy to acknowledge God. I understand that. I've heard stories, Brother Doug's told stories, of going into the workplace and on break, sitting down and opening his Bible and reading his Bible and the ridicule that can become just because you've got a Bible open. It's not easy, but it's always right. Acknowledge God. Acknowledge God. While looking at the men who have the real blessings of God upon their lives, you will find in probably every situation a continuous acknowledging of God. Always there. They're constant. They're, they're in constant awareness of the Master. They're in constant awareness that He's with them. They're driving down the road. They're walking on a sidewalk. They're working. They're in church. They're at the house. They're doing something on the computer. They are constantly aware God is here. They are constantly acknowledging 
that he is present, it'll change some things you do when you act, when you realize God is there. To the shame of most Christians, most Christians act more like atheists than Christians. Oh, they may be in church on Sunday, but where are they on Friday nights? Well, what are our teams doing on a Friday night and show up in church on Sunday? Are your actions the same? Where are our, what are our adults watching on television and computers and then go to church on a Sunday or Wednesday? Are our actions the same? Can you see an issue? We find that this acknowledgement of God, he did not say in some of thy ways acknowledge him, but he said in all thy ways. Acknowledge him. Well, why didn't God tell me which way to go? Are you acknowledging God? Are you striving for a continuous acknowledging of God? I feel like in life I've reached a dead end street. Why didn't God keep me off this? It wasn't God's fault. Not if you haven't been acknowledging him as best you can. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. If we acknowledge God as Lord, he'll always direct us in a way that will be most blessed filled. Always do it. Living in Christ's presence and under Christ's leadership is not always the, the easiest path to follow. You say, wait a minute, I think it's kind of difficult. I promise you the world is more difficult no, than Christ. Right. I promise you the weight of the world you'll find to be more heavy than Christ taking your load, casting your burden on Him, yoking up with Him. Listen, you yoke up with Christ, He's doing all the pulling. Yeah. You just happen to get to go where He goes. What I'm saying is, is that many times it may cost you to serve God Almighty, but you'll find out in the end He blessed you more than it cost mm -hmm. you. Yes. We must learn to live in the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. You say, I am living in there. He's everywhere I go. No, you're not catching what I'm saying. There are times too frequently for probably all of us that we somehow begin to live without the understanding I'm in the presence of Christ. May we be conscious, that's a good way to say it, of living in the presence of Christ. Be it at the job, be it at home, be it at church, be it at wherever we go. May we be conscious to live in the presence of Christ. Look with me in Galatians 6. I was there this morning in verse 9. In Galatians chapter 6. And I come back to it again this evening. What a marvelous verse. I have it as the key verse in chapter 6 of Galatians. And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God promises a harvest. You keep in the presence of Christ. Those who have had the richest blessings of God have been those who've had the habit of doing right as striving for it all the time. Striving for it. I understand nobody's sinlessly perfect. But I promise you this. Christians that are right with their God do not live in sin and not and it not grieve them. It would be a bother. And I understand we can get so far away that we somehow lose sight and we kind of lose a drift. But somewhere there should be a drawing taking place. If you really love the Lord, do right. Do right. You develop a desire to go to church. My dad told me when he was 95 years old, he said, I care for your mom. She was Alzheimer's. And so she stayed home and he had help come in. And he said, I care for her and I have to miss church too frequently. And he said, I can tell you this, Bill, it's easy to get out of the habit of going to church. Don't do that. Just go to church. Go to church, go to church, go to church. If a pandemic hits and we can't, then, then force yourself when the pandemic's over, go back to church, go to church, go to church. I stated be baptized. 
You develop a desire to be baptized. A saved person should, should just want to be obedient. You, get, you develop a desire to tell others about Jesus Christ. You develop a desire to support your church with its tithe. You develop a desire to read this Bible. You develop a desire to pray. You develop a desire to live holy unto God. Amen. When we surrender to Christ, we graduate from doing right just because it's right to doing right because we want to please our Lord. There's a difference. We graduate from doing right because, well, you know, somebody's watching me. I guess I have to do right to doing right because God is pleased. Job is a wonderful illustration of it. Job was a man that did right habitually. He just learned and got in the habit he wanted his God pleased one day Satan was allowed by God to unleash his fury on Job when he unleashed that fury on Job look with me over in Job chapter 1 it's, per, it's the book right in front of Psalms and go to Job chapter 1 and verse 20 in one day Job lost and he was a wealthy man he lost all his wealth he lost all his children. And in that Job chapter 1 and verse 20, look at the words of God, how Job responded. Then Job arose and rent his clothes, excuse me, and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Death has struck his home. As sad as it is to lose a child, how much more sad is it to lose all of them like that? Not just take a dip in the stock. Everything is gone. But Job was a man that he allowed God to develop the habit of worshiping within him. And when he lost everything, he fell on his face and worshipped just like he worshipped the Amen. day before. Amen. Just like he had been worshipping on a daily basis. Daily basis. Wonderful time with the family. Wonderful time counting my money. My bank account's building up. Boom, I lose it all. He still worshipped. Mm. He was living for his Lord and he got in the habit of it. Job didn't quit serving God. Job didn't stop loving God. Job didn't stop worshiping God. Notice verse 21. Here's what he said when he worshiped. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. And then naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave. And the Lord hath taken away. I got it underlined. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. He's lost it all. And he's still blessing his God. Yeah. Preacher, I want the blessings of God. Would you learn to acknowledge God all the time? Look at verse 22. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He could have been tempted to say, why did you turn Satan loose on me? Of all the people in the world, I'm trying to live for you and you let him loose on me. He could have gotten mad at God, shook his fist at God, challenged God, but instead he worshiped God and blessed God. Look in Job 42 and verse 10. In verse 10, the scripture says, and, though, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Do you see what happened in the when? The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You say, oh, well, he's going to get dish out two times as much. No, 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 you got the wrong motive. You just live for God and trust Him to do that which is right by you. 
If he gives you back what you had, if he doesn't give you anything, just trust God. Do things because it's God, not because of what you can get out of it. But here we've got these friends of Job that came in and they're, they're telling Job, all of this is your fault. And they, as, he, as Job put it, they are miserable friends. But what was Job doing? Praying for his friends. When Job had the right attitude, God turned things around for him. When Job was worshiping, when Job was blessing, when Job was praying, God says, listen, I've let Satan have his way with Job. And Job just is still in the habit of worshiping, praying, and blessing me. Let me give us another thought. Look in the book of Leviticus. Acknowledge God. That's the one we just dealt with. And this one we want to deal with. Live a sanctified life. Leviticus chapter 20. In Leviticus chapter 20, I come to verse 7. The scripture says, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am holy. Do you understand for holiness in you who it's up to? As a child of God, it's up to you. You say, well, why didn't God do it? He doesn't force anybody to do anything. And he says right there, you do the sanctifying of yourself. You separate yourself unto God. You quit trying to look like the world. You quit trying to talk like the world. You quit trying to look at the world. You quit trying to talk like the world. You quit trying to act like the world. Sanctify yourself. Didn't God save me? If, he, if you're saved, yes, He saved you. Didn't He sanctify me? Absolutely, you're set apart from the rest of the world. But the sanctification as physically speaking, He said it's your business. He'll empower us if we seek Him. But don't just get in the boat and float down through life whichever way the stream's going. You sanctify yourself. That's what he said. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I look into verse 23. The scripture says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be sanctified means to be set apart from the world and unto God. When we get saved, God separates us from the world and its system. It's controlled by Satan and we're living in it. I understand that. You say it's, it, it, that seems almost impossible. Let me remind you, Sunday school, Mary was a virgin and she found, was found right with God in a wicked society of Nazareth. It can be done. You do not have to live like the world. At salvation, he also separates us to a life of serving him. The cults, they've been set apart in a false way. The cults that, that deny Christ or taint the deity of Christ in a, in a different than the scriptural way. We who are saved are indwelt by the God Christ that forever has been, that created everything and forever shall be. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I go to verse 19. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I've got a, a wrong passage. Let me just read to you. I had it written down. I wanted you to see it, but you're not going to see it. 